The first passage for today comes from the Gospel of Luke, the second chapter, verses 25 through 32. Hear now the word of the Lord. Now, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. This man was righteous and devout, looking forward to the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit rested on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Master, now you are dismissing your servant in peace according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Our second scripture reading comes to us today from the book of Ezra. Let us hear God's word to us. In the first year of King Cyrus of Persia's rule, to fulfill the Lord's word spoken by Jeremiah, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Persia's King Cyrus. The king issued a proclamation throughout his kingdom, it was also in writing, that stated, Persia's King Cyrus says, the Lord, the God of heaven has given me all the kingdoms of the earth. He has commanded me to build him a house at Jerusalem, at Judah. If there are any of you that are from his people, may their God be with them. They may go up to Jerusalem and Judah and build in the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. And as for all those who remain in the various places where they are living, let the people of those places supply them with silver and gold and with goods and livestock, together with the spontaneous gifts for God's house in Jerusalem. When the seventh month came and the Israelites were back in their towns, the people gathered together as one in Jerusalem. Then Jeshua, Josadak's son, along with his fellow priests, and Zerubbabel, Sheltiel's son, along with his kin, started to rebuild the altar of Israel's God so that they might offer entirely burned offerings upon it as prescribed in the instruction from Moses, the man of God. They set up the altar on its foundations because they were afraid of the neighboring peoples, and they offered entirely burned offerings upon it to the Lord, both morning and the evening offerings. They celebrated the festival of booths, as prescribed, and every day they presented the number of entirely burned offerings required by ordinance for that day. When the builders laid the foundation of the Lord's temple, the priests clothed in their vests and carrying their trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph with cymbals, arose to praise the Lord according to the directions of Israel's King David. They praised and gave thanks to God, singing responsively, He is good. His graciousness for Israel is forever. All of the people shouted with praise to the Lord because the foundation of the Lord's house had been laid. But many of the older priests and Levites and heads of families who had seen the first house, wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this house, although many others shouted with joy. No one could distinguish between the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping, because the people rejoiced very loudly. The sound was heard at a great distance. Friends, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. 
Welcome to our observance of Joy Sunday. This summer, I had the pleasure of dwelling in joy in Mr. Rogers' world. And if you want a feel-good boost, I recommend it. Reading and listening to podcasts and just watching some of his old shows. I also recommend doing image searches for joy. While there are some really fantastic images to be found, even better than this is going through your own archives. When I first held my nephew over 20 years ago, I experienced a joy I hadn't thought possible. It was quite an ordeal getting to him, which is a story for another time. So he was actually about 18 hours old when I first held him. Technically, it was the day after his birth. But it was my joy to be present for the day that my second nephew was born, just over 18 years ago. You may pardon the resolution. These digital images are from 18 and 20 years ago. The baby in that second picture was so excited to welcome my first baby, Isaac. And what a joyful baby Isaac was. <laughs> it was really hard to narrow these down. <laughs> I have loved watching the joy of these brothers, in part because I've been so lucky to have the joy of the close relationship with my sister. While kids seem to have a boundless capacity for joy, there are many things that bring us joy. I know kids aren't everybody's bag. Like time with friends and the gift of community, outdoor fun, or enjoying all of God's creatures. <laughs> There's the joy of fireworks and music and pride and creative endeavors and so much more. Thank God for the gift of joy. Of course, like so much in this life, joy, too, can be complicated, as our candle so aptly demonstrated this morning. <laughs> Scripture attests to this truth. Our reading from Ezra is a portrait of complicated joy. Continuing in the narrative of Scripture, the promised return from exile is here. King Cyrus issued an edict releasing the Israelites from captivity in Babylon, even sending them back to Judah with gifts and provisions for their return and for the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. Not all Israelites chose to return. Many of them had built good lives in Babylon. After all, God had told them to do just that, to build houses and plant gardens and establish families there and they didn't want to leave. And it wasn't like there was all that much to get back to, aside from the hard physical and emotional labor of rebuilding. Still, many went. Slowly but surely, they began to rebuild. After a couple of years, when they started to get their bearings again, the focus turned to the temple grounds. When they were finally ready to lay the foundation, it was a huge celebration the people were called in together from Jerusalem for, uh, into Jerusalem for this momentous occasion. The shouts of joy were joined by cries of grief, and the sound could be heard far away. Anyone listening from far away wouldn't have been able to distinguish between the two, between the sounds of joy and the sounds of sorrow. This is what a friend of mine calls joy sorrow. Lara and Scott were high school sweethearts. Scott was a few years younger. He was just 14 when they started dating, but they stayed together and finally got married once they had both finished college. I met them at Louisville Seminary where Scott was a shining star just a couple years ahead of me, and he was so gifted but also so real and down to earth. And you could just tell by looking at them, their marriage was the real deal. They had an adorable little baby who 
just started his first year at Westminster College, where both Scott and Laura went. And their youngest son, their fourth child, was due around the time that my Micah was born, but waited a few weeks longer to make his debut, so he will be eight next week. Baby number four was only a few, a year and a, a bit old when Scott began to have a variety of strange health issues, and it took a number of months more to discover the culprit, angiosarcoma, an incredibly rare and aggressive form of cancer. Scott died in February of 2017. Lara's reflections leading up to that and in the almost seven years since have been joy sorrowful. The sorrow is more acute because the joy was so great. And the joys of today, while fully embraced and celebrated, have a shadow. The ache that her best friend is not there to experience them with her. Joy sorrow. The scene at the temple reconstruction site is joy sorrowful. The very fact that the Israelites were back in Jerusalem getting ready to rebuild the temple was a joy that would not have even been imaginable. And yet, there was that communal memory of loss of what had been. Many tears had been shed. We read about that in Psalm 137. But there were deeper levels of hurt and trauma yet to be processed and mourned. Advent is my favorite season of the year. While so much around us is buzzing with the expectation of Christmas joy, Advent is a way to prepare for that joyful event while still acknowledging the joy sorrow all around us. Maybe its marketing slogan could be Advent. It's complicated. While hope, peace, joy, and love all sound good, this Sunday of joy is actually meant to be an interruption of what has historically been an otherwise more somber season. Yet even the joyful readings that fall on this Sunday are tempered by sorrow and by loss, with the memory of exile, and sometimes with the recognition of the worldly order that God is turning around. But that also recognizes that the world that God is turning around is still very messed up today. When I look for pictures of joy, it's no wonder that so many of them are of children, because most of them don't yet know how to temper their joy. They are more likely to experience it unadulterated, or maybe unadulted. <laughs> Who better to teach us about joy, about pure, unadulterated joy, than a baby? Our first reading is kind of funny. It skips ahead after Jesus' birth, and it gives us the contrast between the elderly Simeon the one who had stayed alert for the consolation of Israel and the embodiment of that consolation in the infant resting in his arms. Next week, we'll gather for the longest night service, which this year is at Parkview Mennonite rather than Trinity. And we will be invited to name our joys and our sorrows. And even though today is Joy Sunday, there is room for sorrow here too. Because like Advent, joy is complicated. Advent invites us to hold the tension between joy and sorrow, to hold space for that weirdness of joy-sorrow. We are not entirely unlike that community of God's people gathered in Jerusalem. There are so many things that we are each holding in our lives. Lots of heaviness in memories or in present realities. But there is still joy. There is room for all of it and room for us to hold it together. It is the foundation of sacred space. It is the place where God's presence dwells. 
gathered as God's people in a place and a space that transcends these walls, that is made sacred by God's presence, what do we bring today? I'm inviting us into a space of joy sorrow. If you're joining us online, you can share comments on Facebook. So family of God, how have you experienced joy recently? And what burdens might we carry together? We've experienced the joy of our first choir piece since before COVID. The joy of geese traveling and the honking outside the window. Eagle badge awarded on Tuesday. Mm -hmm. The joy of an eagle badge awarded on Tuesday. Needed rain. Needed rain. And the sorrow that it's not snow. And the sorrow. <laughs> the sorrow that it's not snow. The joy of getting to have Bryce's mom and my dad on the live stream this morning. The joy of a new job. The joy of a new job. The sorrow in Tennessee from the tornadoes. The sorrow in Tennessee from the tornadoes. And the joy of beautiful music and the sorrow that Paolo's going away for a while. <laughs> The joy of beautiful music and the sorrow that Paolo's going away for a while. The sorrow of Israel and Gaza. Mm, yeah. Yeah. The sorrow of Israel and Gaza. The joy that Bill is back from Congo. The, the joy that Bill Reinhold is back safely from Congo. And seeing friends I hadn't seen in 35 years Aww. and mourning those who have gone. Mm. Yeah. And seeing friends that he hadn't seen in 35 years and mourning those who have gone. The joy of Dale and Gracie Upton's little boy, Danny. Uh, Daniel Upton and Gracie Upton's little boy, Danny. Daniel and Gracie's little boy, da Danny. The sorrow of di diagnosis of diseases and mm -hmm. the joy of the magic of medicine. Mm -hmm. The sorrow of the diagnoses of diseases and the joy of the magic of medicine. The joy that Las Vegas normally holds juxtaposed with the sorrow of the recent shooting. The joy that Las Vegas normally holds juxtaposed with the recent shooting. The joys of kinship and the sorrow of those we've lost. The joys of friendship and the sorrows of those we've lost. The joy of walking to school in the morning when the first snowflakes are coming down. And seeing wonderful neighbors who are also Trinity family. The joy of the stars in the sky and the sorrow of family getting away. The joy of the stars in the sky and the family being away. Running under the curse of climate change. The sorrow of the world groaning under the curse of climate change. The joy of seeing beauty. The joy of seeing beauty. Friends, surely God is with us. Amen.